I think a lot of poetry is about speaking back to power. You know, readers, you can only ask so much of them, right? I mean, that, and if you want them to focus their energy on, you know, the shimmering, gorgeous ambiguity of your finest imagery, you know, and, and you're also asking them to try to, like, figure out where the fuck they are, yeah. then that's, like, a lot. Welcome to the Ruth Stonehouse podcast. I'm Bianca Stone, and I'm talking today with the poet Matthew Zapruder. Matthew Zapruder is the author of five collections of poetry, most recently Father's Day from Copper Canyon Press, as well as the amazing book, Why Poetry? A Book of Prose from Echo House, HarperCollins. He's an associate professor at the MFA at St. Mary's College in California, and he's also the editor at large at Wave Books. Matthew, welcome. Thanks, Bianca. It's great to see you. So there's so much I want to talk to you about um, today, uh, but I think at the core of everything we discuss um, is your actual poetry, which I find to be totally magnificent and unique. So I thought today we could start with you reading a poem before we launch into the larger discussion of poetry. Sure. Um, yeah, well, um, this I'll read a new po newish poem. Um, this is... Uh, something that kind of came out of, I think, a lot of experiences of staring at a screen, which we've all had. So I think it's more or less self-explanatory, um, I think. And um, I, I was on a, a, a during, during the, during the um, period of teaching online, I was also doing a lot of, um, let's say, committee work at my college where I teach. So I was on meetings the entire day and it just got yeah, to the geez. point where I, all I could do was like try to punch a hole through it was to write a poem. And so uh, this is the evening meeting. Uh, the evening meeting. Finally, the hour has come. It is time for the long journey. I say to my wife and child a last farewell and click the blue button. My face appears across from my face. It is the day we will virtually discuss the unpredictable resolutions. I'm sure obscurely will decide my fate. The ostensible chair begins to speak. Thank you for your electrons. I hope you're well in these days, or at least surviving. I touch the hem of a book. Someone says, that's a lot of togetherness. Someone says, the asymptote of dust. The chair mutes us all. It's so good to see all your faces. Thank you for availing this interstitial complication to consider these extraordinary times. I put on my educator mask and stare into the unsmiling grid, trying to look as if I understand the one named after a star. She has mastered this new technology. She shares the document of potential paths through the forest into uncertain autumn. We talk and wander among them. We must decide but cannot stop. A great blanket of acknowledged despair, silence threatens until the one with all the hidden power speaks. His eye clap glasses catch the light of an Akari. It is my sad role to remind you, yes, there are bodies piled in the streets, but don't forget the learning outcomes. Then the most mordant of us says, if I may quote my accountant, all solutions are suboptimal. Laughter ripples through the proximate squares. For a moment, we sit sensing vital decisions. Faces keep speaking. They dissolve and become shapes on my screen. More and more, they resemble lonely ships carrying vital protocols into the distance. The voices get further away. At last, the endless meeting ends. I begin to recite the ever more infinite list of things I do not know. <laughs> totally captured it. Oh my God. I, I, I love, there's so much I love about this. A, that you're like, okay, I'm gonna make something creative out of this <laughs> like creativity vortex, like vacuum. Um, and I, I love the, the sardonic, tone of that but also the true true beauty that that did come out of it um 
but also what strikes me in that poem is what strikes me in a lot of your poetry, which is this um, this endless, really relentless self-investigation that seems to be happening um, with you concerning like how poetry works and doesn't work, um, how we relate to one another in the world and how that works in poetry itself. But I guess just generally, do you find poetry to be a work of self-investigation? Um, I do, I do. I think, um, I mean, without being overly dramatic, I mean, I think it's a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the and part, a big part of that is self-examination because, you know, I think, you know, like if you just take this poem, I mean, it's, you know, a lot, I think a lot of people can relate to being in this situation, whatever their careers are, whatever their jobs are, you know, or just even family life or whatever, like all this performing we were doing online and staring at our own faces while we're doing it. It's so, um, it's, you know, dehumanizing basically. And like, I, mm -hmm. like I was, I felt dehumanized. I felt like everybody was dehumanized constantly. And I, the only way I could think of personally to push back was to try to make something out of it, you know, like to try to make a, to try to go into it. And I mean, there was a part of me that was like, like, I'm pretty sure the world doesn't need like another poem about being on Zoom. Like, uh, like, like we need a lot of things. <laughs> we're just starting writing these poems. Maybe it needs, maybe it does need them. That's true. But I, I mean, it wasn't like, oh, I wasn't necessarily thinking, oh, the world needs this so badly right. or whatever. I was more thinking I need to survive this experience and the only right. way I can do it. I mean, I can complain to my friends. I can text. I can, you know, blah, blah, blah. Or I can like go in, like, I yeah. can, like just like go in and see what see take the language and start twerking it and messing with it and see what's there to try to survive and like you know basically I, it made me I don't want to say it made me feel better but it made me feel like all this time doing this wasn't wasted you know that like I was that I learned something I guess yeah. even if I can't say exactly what I learned you right. know I mean I don't know I don't know that poem has like a message or anything exactly except that we're kind of you know in a weird situation but yeah, I mean, it's just sort of, it does sort of point to the fact that we don't have a lot of control over this, the life that we live, the situations we find ourselves in that aren't, um, aren't great and vivid and like full of, you know, creativity and life and fun, um, but that poetry isn't made just to experience, just to explore the like good, interesting, I think a lot. I think a lot of poetry is about um, speaking back to power, um, kind of carving out a private space or an independent space or a resistant space or like just a free space, you know, or you know, whatever that word free means. We could spend a long time talking about that, but like, you know, yeah. but this is this is like I think just you know me pushing back in a way that I think like a lot of people want to push back you know, yeah. right? you know they uh, i mean and and this impulse is is i'm sure is in all of us you know and so it's just it just i indulged it i have a way of indulging it and i and i do feel and to the extent to which i feel like it's useful i mean i do think it's you know if you create that space it is available to other people if they want it you know so it's not right. a totally selfish i mean that yes it isn't so so I guess there's a long way of answering your question. It's like, yeah, totally. It's about self-investigation and I'm interested in investing in the self and being kind of like, in a way, like ruthless with myself. Yep. Um, you know, and, and, but also, you know, I'm interested in hopefully along the way, making spaces that are available for other people to kind of be in and be separated from the things that are, you know, assaulting them essentially, you know, um, you know that when a poet does that it, it it might be remind people that they can also do that right so they can talk back even in their minds to themselves i mean to me like you know the like the the, the there's always in this poem and you know there's always somebody with more power who keeps revealing himself you know 
it's like there are these levels of like um you know who has the real power and that's true certainly in academia you know there's like you know it's such a hierarchical feudal system and there's always some yeah. system of power that you're barely aware of unless you've been at an institution for like three thousand years you now there's somebody who's like actually got the fingers on the lever of power to whatever extent that matters that that punk part of you that just wants to be like fuck you you know i can yeah. tell a joke about somebody and like push back against the person who's like the, the the chair and the authority figure is like you know i think that's pretty good like that's a good role for poetry too you know absolutely like flipping the bird just like right straight into the face of like the authority i know i had this away. Yeah, I, I did have this feeling that the, you know I was reading that poem and I was like, this is totally like flipping the bird to the like chairman. And I was like, I wonder if he's like reading Matthew's poems and like, um, probably not. But uh, but there's a delight in being like, and you can't do anything about it because this is poetry. Yeah. This is not like in the New York Times as like an ad, you know op ed or something. Yeah, um, I mean, and, and you know, I did. I mean, I've written. You know, I've written. I got into this thing where I was writing these tonka. You know whatever the um that five line yeah, what, what's a tonka the five line japanese form um yeah, so it's a haiku and then there's five seven five and then there's two seven syllable lines that follow it and it's it's tonka are the basis of um um a collaborative japanese um writing practice that's renga that's existed you know for you know for hundreds and hundreds of years and you know, Basho and uh, all their Japanese poets were um, Renga masters and the haiku was kind of pulled out of Renga. It, it was the haiku was the first three lines of a Renga. Oh, um, and okay. so so it, it, it wasn't all, you know, it became an independent literary form haiku, mm -hmm. but initially it was just the beginning. Uh, it wasn't just, I mean, it was the beginning that had pride of place is the beginning of a Renga. So people would you know, you, me, and Ben, and like, you know, we'd get around and drink little cups of wine, and for hours we would write, we would write a renga, and I would write, you know, three lines, and you'd write two, and then Ben would write three, and then I'd write two, and blah, 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 so, so, and around, 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 and there were lots of conventions and lots of, anyway, so Tonka is a kind of like extended haiku sort of five-line thing, and and so I wrote a lot of uh, Tonka for my, um, for my English department, um, which are extremely, <laughs> you know, Biting. Not, yeah i mean now that i'm a full professor I'm, i can i can i can publish them wherever i want and yeah nobody can do anything about it but uh, so it was it, um but yeah it was again just like a way of pushing back right just, just, right like, so frustrated and... right. it's 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 so ironic because so many of our poets so many of us poets are like desperately seeking searching for this um teaching job in academia and it's so highly competitive and you put so much work into it and then it's like you get there and you're like in prison <laughs> um, yeah it's a special kind of uh prison academia because obviously you know of course it's you know and you know, we need health care and you know you get money right and you get a lot of time off or whatever but yeah. like you know academia has become um it's not our daddy and mommy's academia let's just put it that way i mean yeah. there's a lot of demands on professors you know that are i mean we were talking about a little bit before this and and um you know but there's just a lot of they expect a lot out of you and so it's like yeah you know but whatever i mean it's a job you know, yeah let they pay you so but but some complaining is definitely in order to you know my cat <laughs> my cat christ god forbid i close the door <laughs> I was gonna bring my dog. I was gonna bring my dog in here, but I figured that would go not well. So, hey, Kit, what's your cat's name? This is Ladybird. Oh, Lady Bird. she's a beast. Just she's took her to the great. vet. They checked overweight in the overweight box. Oh, you don't look overweight to me. You just look um, delicious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you want to eat my cat? <laughs> I gotta do it right now. Um, <laughs> she's pretty cute. Um, but um, yeah. So I um yeah anyway so that so it's 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 been you know but but yeah the writing I mean I'm trying to stay away from like becoming an academic poet you know poet who complains about academia in his poems that oh, would yeah. be, that'd be a dark fate no, it's too late you <laughs> a whole series of talkers about it so yeah that will remain <laughs> that will probably remain in my computer but um yeah on my typewriter so 
this is something I've been thinking a lot about uh, in terms of like teaching and working on people's manuscripts, but uh, you wrote that you wrote, you wrote uh, one of the beneficial side effects of writing poetry to cement things in my memory. And then another time you wrote, I don't keep a journal. So for me, poems are often the way that I can not only preserve a certain time, but also get more deeply into my experience of that time itself. Um, how do you see memory working in poetry? I see so many students struggling with, we'll say memoir and poetry, in, memoir impulses in poetry. I think the second part of the question is, um, how do you balance information giving in poetry? And I think that's also narrative um, and negative capability or attention to absence of information it can be really confusing to talk to students about um, this. I find it hard to articulate to them that like, I need more information. I'm confused about what's happening in this poem. Plus like you have too much information in here. Yeah. And it's like, so <laughs> I'm like, I want ambiguity, but like, I, I don't confused. like being confused. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I know exactly what you mean. And it's, it's, um, it's tough because, you know, it's like, Sometimes, I mean, I'd say not just with students, but my own work, I mean, I'm being confusing in the wrong place, kind of, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I guess. And so it's like, it's like, you know, there's certain, I mean, you can't make rules about it, right? But like, there's certain things that it's not, almost always, it's not a good idea to be like, um, unspecific or, or confusing or ambiguous about something boring like for instance like where am right. i <laughs> like right right like, right. like, like at what room am i am i like am i in a museum or i am, am i flying an airplane or am i cooking dinner or like i mean yeah. that's not a particularly interesting thing to be confused about unless your palm is productively shimmering between being in an airplane and cooking dinner you know in which case then okay then then you know, everything I said is not true, but like, but I mean, you know, usually that's not the case. I mean, usually it's just somebody's doing something and they just haven't, you know, and I mean, it's really going to sound ridiculous, but I mean, I've had this conversation 5,000 times with students where I'm like, what would you, I mean, way more than 5,000 times, but like, what would you, like, let's say you were going to title this poem in the most explicit way possible. Like, what would you call it? You know, or you talk to them for 20 minutes and then you realize they're like, those poems, you know, hiking to my grandmother's grave through the tall grasses of Goshen. Right. You know, and you're like, what if you just called it that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, that would get away, that would get rid of like 80% of like the stuff that, and because I always say to myself and to other people, I'm like, you know, readers, it, you can only ask so much of them, right? I mean, that, and if you right. want them to focus their energy on, you know, the shimmering, gorgeous ambiguity of your finest imagery, you know, and, and you're also asking them to try to like figure out where the fuck they are. Yeah. Then that's like a lot to ask someone to do. And it's maybe not, right. I'm not going to say it's never useful or it's never artistically productive. I mean, you know, I mean, there are cases where it is, but like, but it's just, you know, you know, it's a good idea to at least try out not being confusing about certain aspects of things and see if it really does ruin your poem. And usually it doesn't, you know. So I don't know if that really answers your that, that that's about being information. That's that's addressing the second your second question, which is about information balancing information or whatever. And you know, it's it's we're trying to think of an example, you know, it's like um like uh you know, I, I guess for me the best I, I don't like my poems unless there's something in them that I don't understand. Mm, yeah. You know, I, I don't unless there's something in them that's truly like feels like I'm really reaching. Yeah. And it's really like kind of, you know, beyond me in a way, but I mm -hmm. can't get there without, you know, if the whole thing is like that, it's a tough, it's tough for me. You know, it's like, it's almost like that's the little, that's the jewel and like everything around it is, is a, is a kind of like, um encasement for it and and so you know i don't i don't want to i don't want to have the whole thing be just like falling apart all the time you know but that's just me 
and that's that's not you know it's not for everybody right well it's interesting because your poetry does i feel like you are very good and i've seen this sort of evolve and get more clear in your work is um you say things in the most straightforward way possible to the point where it becomes really strange how specifically accurate you've set us up into what's happening like um and then but somehow within that then we're able to have more strange lyrical embellishments within that but but there's something so grounding almost robotic about um the directness with oh. some description and then but then you that offers seems to offer you so much more room for play and ambiguity yeah well part of it is part of it is that i like the way regular regular quote unquote language sound i mean ordinary whatever it's all being in quotes but like conversational language or direct language very direct language sounds yeah i like the sound of that it, it appeals to my ear mm -hmm. you know i mean different I mean, I'm going to say something super obvious, which is that different registers of language appeal to different ears. And, you know, yeah, Gerard I don't Manley think that's... Hopkins, well, Gerard Manley Hopkins or Hart Crane or even some of them, you know, one of a poet I adore, Sylvie Plath, you know, the, the, what, the thing that appealed to their ear was probably something that generally speaking was, was you know, a bit higher register, you know, than what appeals to my ear. I just, it just, something a little mm. more close to conversational language just appeals to me and it's just you know it's a it's a you know it's just it's almost like a personality thing and it's not mm -hmm. a value judgment but I, can i read you something um yes because because you were thinking about you were talking about so so you know direct language or like you know what you think of as like almost robotic and i, I would call it like sort of maybe like highly almost like parodically logical mm. language mm -hmm. and like this is something that i took from you know i learned how to do this from a certain group of poets um mm -hmm. you know from eastern and central european poets um 20 of the 20th century i mean they they all whether you talk about zimborska or you know vasco popa or miroslav halab or um tomas shalaman you know and, and in different ways they all and you know kind of were in that they 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 or speaking of herbert they all kind of played with this, like, a, I don't want to say official language, but kind of like, like very flat, mm -hmm. like logical language. And they mm -hmm. would sort of push against it and push play with it or whatever. And also, you know, certain, you know, poet like Giannis Ritsos does the same thing in a lot of ways. But um, anyway, but this is a poem by Vasco Popa that's, that's everybody, know, a lot of people know this poem, but it's, um, but I know when you were saying that, I was thinking about the little box poems. Do, do you mm -hmm. know, do you know the poems? The little box. This is translated by Simic, actually. Um, it sounds very Simic. Serbian poet um, Vasco Popa, and so right. this is and he has his, sir, and so Popa writes poems. A lot of his poems are in series, you know. Right. So he'll write a bunch of poems around the same kind of subject. And these these poems are called um, the, the Little Box. Is the name of the series or whatever. And so the first poem is called the Little Box. And this is translated by Charles Simic. The Little Box. The Little Box gets her first teeth and her little length, little width, little emptiness, and all the rest she has. The little box continues growing. The cupboard that she was inside is now inside her. And she goes bigger, bigger, bigger. Now the room is inside her, and the house, and the city, and the earth, and the world she was in before. The little box remembers her childhood, and by a great, great longing, she becomes a little box again. Now in the little box, you have the whole world in miniature. You can easily put it in a pocket, easily steal it, easily lose it. Take care of the little box. So like that kind of like, almost like. <laughs> God, I hear that, that poem. I'm like, that, that's the kind of poem that makes me, and it's kind of interesting because it kind of relates to the, first part of the question about mm -hmm. memory and trying yeah. to be narrative and there's something I hear that poem I'm like that's the kind of poem I want to write about my mother or something you know right like, exactly like, yeah like, like because, you're like because, oh shit that's how I should have done it like not like tell that, the story about what happened like it's it's I wouldn't say it's an either or thing but I would yeah. say that 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 rechannels that narrative 
impulse into a kind of like, let's say, rhetorical or logical impulse. It's almost like a logical proof. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that those that 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 the lot the Eastern and Central European poets I mentioned, they have a kind of like like almost like parodically logical way of moving through the poem, like this, then, this, then. But of course, the 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 movement from the this to the then is so fucking weird and like yeah. you know and like intuitive and associative or whatever. I mean, Shimborska has that. I mean, she her poems seem like people love her poems because they think they're simple mm-hmm. but they're actually like yeah. super weird i i but like, that's, but that's my favorite the... yeah. right Sorry, yeah, of course so we love that no no we love that that's the thing of course okay. we love that it's like crystal clear right and it's like so so you know that's that that was mind-blowing for me and my peers mm-hmm. to, because we were coming up in the 1990s at a time when people were not writing poems like this so we found this work Mm-hmm. written by Vasco Popa, by Tomas Shalman, by Zbigniew Karabert. This is before Jaborska won the Nobel Prize. This, all these poets, you know, Anna Sweer, like, all, like a, lot of, a lot of poets, right? And we passed it around, like fucking, you know, like holy, yeah. you know, holy text. What is this? Because, yeah, because, yeah. We, because, because it was like, oh, you can write this way. And, you know, one of the first people who kind of metabolized this was Matt Rohr. Uh, yeah. um, he 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 made it his own mm. and he was the first I feel like he was almost the first poet of our my meaning my not you because you know but, but my my generation of poets born in the 60s and early 70s and so like, the generation so, influenced by your generation <laughs> well the, sorry. um yeah, yeah but, that's but, really, I mean, but, but yeah. so he was the first one in his book, A Hummock and the Malukas, which won the National Poetry Series while he was still at Iowa. Mary Oliver mm-hmm. did it. And that's a great book. I mean, it's mm-hmm. still a great book. It is. It's, but it's, he turned this, he took this, I think he would agree, be the first to agree that he learned something about, you know, how to move through a poem. Um, but but you we kind of made it American, I guess I would say, you know, made, mm-hmm. it, made it a poem and written by an American in their 20s, as mm-hmm. opposed to a, you know, Serbian in his 40s or whatever, 50s. <laughs> you no, know. but not that they're that different, actually. I mean, you could see this poem, that poem I read, you could see it in a literary magazine now for sure, right? I mean, I mean, not, I, you know, I, I think it's, if you're asking if it would be relevant and liked, I think it would be. Yeah, I would be yeah. thrilled, but I would be f- excited to find that poem. But I'm not sure that would have been true in 1994. No, you know, it's when I first Maybe, met, but... when I first met you in 2006, um, somewhere 2008, maybe. Uh, no, yeah, no, it was cl- uh, closer to six. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Um, I was like, what the fuck is this poetry? Like, like you and Roar and stuff. I was like, I didn't that I it's funny now because it's so now it's like the way I write too or I've integrated it into the way I write but like then it was actually I forget how strikingly different the tone was and how I had to really readjust my mind to be like oh I I get this because it's easy to sort of be like when you first when you're used to the way like then I grew up with my grandma was like a poet of the 80s and 90s like that well, she was like in her 80s then but like still that was the poetry that I grew up with um so it was a really hard shift mentally but now I feel like it's very integrated into um my generation's work but that's interesting because I'd never really thought of it as coming from there I always thought it came from Ashbury and but I mean we loved Ashbury but I don't actually think it came from Ashbury I mean I think that I mean, we lo- we worshipped Ashbury. And right. they're definitely, we're taking a lot from him. But uh-huh. actually, I think really what was going on is that, I mean, I would never say that we were reacting against him because I'm, you know, you know, a massive Ashbury fan. But I, I think it was, I mean, it's very complicated to generalize about this stuff. But I would say that, and I'm talking about, I'm talking about the dominant literary culture at this time. There was all kinds of other poetry being written in the 90s. And all kinds of other venues and all kinds of other communities right. 
that has right. nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I'm totally. talking about just like sort of stuff that won prizes and stuff that was published in the Paris Review and stuff that was published, you know, in the New Yorker, that kind of thing. I think right. that the general feeling was um, that a directness, a certain kind of directness was highly unfashionable mm -hmm. and felt, and I remember when I was writing, you know, and starting to write, really being like mocked basically to be honest with you like by, yep. by people who thought that I was like not smart right now, by that's like what it that's what people. honestly the first thing I thought was that didn't sound smart that was yeah. I'm not you talking about it, you I'm no, not no, no, by no, you, it doesn't sound smart yeah, that's exactly it, right right it, I remember <laughs> reading a line I don't remember who wrote it but it was just I'm so sad that was like one of the like in the middle of the poems like yeah. I'm so sad and I was like what the fuck like why like it, it's almost like an anti but that that di directness that bluntness well also there was like a lot of irony at work there too and and there, it was all about tonality too but like you have to like and shift you know your expectations funny about yeah. that is that that's always been there in American poetry I mean like you know that just makes me think of you know one of my you know and, and while Stephen's first book in Harmonium you know there's that poem Gub and All and I think the lines are the world is ugly and the people are sad Mm, yeah that's a line so it's been it's always been there it's like totally. this kind of like American language and like I wasn't like Matt and Joshua and I and others weren't we weren't inventing something new we were just I think we were tapping into a strain of American poetry and you know it's funny about it too is like so my teacher at and in, in was James Tate my mm -hmm. main teacher was James Tate I also studied with Aga Shahid Ali and, and Dara Wire with both two amazing poets and amazing teachers but so Jim, Jim was kind of like the big name there, obviously famous mm -hmm. poet there. But he was going through a little bit of a dip in his um, in his uh, reputation at that point. Um, mm, yeah, not not huge, but I mean, he wasn't like I don't think he would have been brought up as being the main guy at that point or whatever. But he was about to come back into this. You know, he's about to publish Worshipful Worshipful Company of Fletchers and then Shroud of the Gnome, and like those books were huge, and I think they won. National Book Awards and one of them won the National Book Award recently. But anyway, but you know, it was like he's always written in that very direct way. I mean, since the beginning, you know, his, yeah. his poetry has been super straightforward and he's got that kind of Midwestern flat, like hilarious American diction, um, you know, that like he's always, always written that way. So like I was really lucky to study with him because I can imagine having ended up in other environments, you know, where I would have been studying with poets who I didn't actually relate to their, you know, their, their, what they were interested in in terms of registers of language. But Jim was like right there for me. Um, you know, yeah, just, like, that's how you do it. You know? Yeah. He's a big, he's a big one. Oh, it's, it's just so, he, he too, I was like, I remember I thought, the lost pilot was was Tate and then I like read his right. other books and I was like what is ha I just there's something so well it's like that great I mean I've actually looked at this earlier today it's like um yeah it's this great long poem called fuck the astronauts which is like <laughs> so good and it's like completely sounds like you know Breton like it's total like yeah. surrealist like you know, it's like talking about an angel. It was like angel smoking a cigarette on the steps of a bank. And then it's like an angel smoking a bank on the steps of a cigarette, you know, whatever. Like it's yeah. kind of like he's, and he's just going oh, off. So he doesn't good. give a, she does not give a yeah. fuck. He just he doesn't is like, give a fuck. That's the thing. Give is, a fuck. Yeah. He's like, he's like, he's like, I'm doing this because it's, because it's, you know, it's poetry. I'm, a, I'm, he's like, he's like an addict. He's just like, look, he's like looking to score like the yeah. next poetry hit. And he totally. doesn't care what he has to do to get it. And it's like, it's, it's, it's relentless. And I, I just, yeah, but I mean, Ugh, you know, you know he, what? He, yeah, he's the best. There, it, it's like, uh, my brother's, my brother will, he's really into Tate and he'll like, be like, yeah, okay, come listen to this poem. And he'll like <laughs> read me this like, like five minute poem. And I'll just be yeah. like, good it. I'll be like, F <laughs> I give up. Like, I can't even like, Compete and you know you can well, yeah no I know I did whatever you then you're wanna, like whatever I'm great no no I'm just I'm saying great. no no I'm just saying it's like Tate is you know he is very intimidating I he mean, is his, I mean I find him intimidating his poetry intimidating you know it's like it's really you know I, I can only read it in certain moods you know but, but I mean I'm coming back to you know what we were talking about like diction you know <laughs> I mean you know like 
I mean, you know, later on, I came across a poet like James Schuyler. Uh, I had no yeah. idea existed when I was writing, you know, when I was first starting to write poems. Like I'd never, I mean, I think it probably, you know, at some point I read David Lehman's book and then about the uh, last on my guard. And then of course I, you know, and then I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, it's got, and now it's like one of my favorite poets, but yeah, it's like, I don't, my point is, is like, it's a little bit, you know, I also feel this way about surrealism too. It was like, I kind of stumbled on my own like quarter assed version of it. Yeah. And I was sort of working in this area. And then I was like, and then I found these other poets who had been doing this same work for a long time, or maybe even yeah. were dead and had done it for a long time. And it was like, I was like, oh, like, I'm just like scratching at the corner of a corner of a little like piece of construction paper here with my little crayon. And they're yeah. like, you know, and then so it was, it was really, but yeah, I remember when, we were, when I taught your NYU class, I mean, that was a funny thing because because I guess it was, who was it? It was your teacher. It was it Susan who, Stewart. Yeah. And she had, a, um, she had laryngitis. She like couldn't. Yeah, she, like, couldn't talk. she had a health thing. Was, she couldn't, yeah. she couldn't, she couldn't teach. So I came in like a month in and I taught. I it wasn't, it was, we had like two classes with her and then oh, you yeah. like waltzed yeah. in and I was like, who's this guy? <laughs> waltzed in. I was yeah. I, like, I was, I was called, I was, I was, you know, whatever you were like, called up. I was you, called up from the, from the, from the minor leagues, you know, like, totally. pinch well, you were like it's walking injury. across the sixth Avenue from the new school, like right. coming over to the NYU right. and we're all and like, it was fun, but it was funny because you guys were, we had written these formal poems and like you came in and you were like, what are these fucking kids doing writing these like well, well, the funny thing about, <laughs> but the, That wasn't the issue. It wasn't, it wasn't the formal poems. It was the issue. It was that I think there was a kind of what I, what I noticed and I really noticed this with you was, is, and you know, you were really young. I, I don't know how old you were at the time, but I mean like, you, you know, but, but and it was like, I, when I looked at you and your friends, I was like, you all are like in your twenties you're living in New York, you're probably like having the best time ever right now. Totally. Like, and, 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 but you write, like you live like in the forest yeah, with like a bunch of 9,000 year old gnomes. And like, I know and, you were, and, oh, and, 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 but, but then once, but, but, but it was, it was, it, it was interesting because it was like, we all have to do that with our, we, every single person who writes poems has to get out of there. Like, little led out of their literary idea of like what a yeah. thing of what a poem is everybody has to do that yeah nobody's bo- and so we we all carry these things in and like you know and i had my version of that too that was probably frankly a lot less skilled than the version you had that you were doing but like you know but it was interesting because i was like you guys like like you know you're not writing your you who you are you know like in the world and then once you started i mean i'm going to take credit for it but like once once you once you all you know i mean your poems and kathy's poems and other people's poems and they're just like blew up yeah you guys know, like you know it was brutal you know it was actually it does kind of remind me of therapy because like there's some times that are just so brutal and you have so <laughs> much resistance and you have to like kill something it's like facing something like there was something very intense about my experience when you came and like I because I think what I realized is I wanted so badly to change and seeing the possibilities of poetry that I thought I knew everything and I realized that I knew I only knew like a tiny corner um it was really brutal um and so there was, and so then there was this period of time of experimentation that felt really uncomfortable, yeah. but it changed my life. Like, yeah, but, and you were, and it was, it was, but there was a whole scene. I mean, it makes it seem like I'm taking credit for this whole thing, but I think it was part of a whole thing that was happening in poetry. Well, so, that was like, things were yeah. opening up in a certain kind of way at that point that was it really, was. and a lot was changing really fast. I think then, and it was exciting. And I introduced you to the uh, folks at, at the new school yep. and then you all hit it off. And then suddenly you yep. had your own community and you were all yep. doing all these things and you, you accelerated way past me super fast, you know, and it wasn't like, you know, it was, it was just a matter of like being given permission probably to just, you mm-hmm. know, to, to just, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, I remember actually, I think now as a teacher, I would be much more gentle in that situation than I was, but I think, it, I think I got frustrated at a certain point. I was like yelling at you, like not yelling at you, but being like, being like, 
stop writing like an 80 year old man you I know because we were talking like stop writing like Galway Cannell I, I know like, not, that all against, were... not that I have anything against Galway Cannell he's great but he's also was like you know wasn't Bianca Stone you know? right and like it's but that's easy for me to say because I'm not it's not my well that's what teachers yeah but I feel always feel guilty going in like teaching now too because I'm like kind of the same where I'm like okay well I want to be nurturing I don't want to be a dick <laughs> I you know I want to respect where people are coming from what they're trying to do but at the same time I'm like you're limiting yourself so much and I know it's going to be hard to hear but like don't you want to be free like don't don't you want to like right it's also like well okay well what's working is this working for you like are you writing good poems like right, are, you writing, right. are, are you writing poems that people want to read or are you just writing sort of like so are you writing poems that you want to read? I mean, like, I, I, mean, yeah. I feel like, I feel like in, in, you know, and you do have to, obviously, as a teacher, one thing, you know, I think we all learn as we get further on is to, is to really calibrate our, our, you know, reactions based on what students are kind of like, what they're ready to hear, you know, like, I mean, different right. people are in different spaces, at different times. And I mean, I think I, it was easy to perceive that you were a strong individual, like, like in that moment. So, so we could, we could talk in a certain kind of way, you know, and I could be like, like, you know, like you were ready to change and you wanted to, and you were trying to, but it was just like, you just needed somebody to give you permission. So like, well, also to, I was like, re I read the pajamas and I was like, holy shit, I want to write like <laughs> this. Like, I really thought that, like, I was like, this is exciting me in a way that I you know was very new to me I hadn't even read Ashbury at that point you know like I was mm. reading Ashbury for the first time but mm. I didn't feel like I could write like get in with like writing anywhere near like Ashbury well, so of crazy. course you can't like, because I, I can't write like him either I mean yeah, you know, no, Ashbury, and it's not, like, I'm not saying I can write like you either no 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 but I'm closer no but, what but I felt doing, more let into your poems like your poems but we're I still are yeah, I well, yeah. I read your poems now. And I'm like, I want to write a poem after I read a Matthew's Approver poem. Like, well, we're we're closer um, in a lot of ways. I mean, Ashbury, you know, is is is, you know, in so many ways. I mean, he was really just so deep in a certain kind of aesthetic of the '50s and '60s that was, yeah, you know, and have to do with art and like, right, um, a certain kind of queerness. I guess I would say that is yeah. very you know, that O'Hara has too, that like highly, um, I, I don't know, ironic isn't maybe the right word, but like self-conscious, mm -hmm. um, uh, performative, um, it's extremely um, intelligent all the time, I feel like. And it's like, you know, it's just, it's just a very high level. And I, I you know, I wasn't, I didn't want, I, I love Ashbury. I adore, and when I read an Ashbury poem, I want to write like him. But I'm not, I'm so different from him in my body, in my experience, like who I am or whatever. It wouldn't make any sense for me to write like Ashbury, you know? There are little bits and pieces of Ashbury that I, you know, that drift into my poems, I'm sure, because he had such a, but it's the same thing with Tate, right? You right. know, it's like, it's like he's, you know, I can't write like him. I mean, he's, he's like a, he's a Midwesterner who, who, grew up in a Pentecostal household and was like, and his, and his brain is different. And so, you know, so I think, but it's like when you're, when you're teaching or when you run into a teacher or, or peer or somebody, you know, sometimes enough of you overlaps yep. to like change you and, and, or to allow you to change yourself. And I'm sure that, you know, happened for you and me, that makes sense, you know, and it yeah. happened for me and other people, you know, right. and it's, it's, and it's, and it is, it is great when it works. It's really, I mean, I'm very proud, you know, that, you know, when I look at your poems and I see your work, I think you write, I think you write great poems. And I think you, you know, I think you're, you know, you totally go for it. And they like have like tons of energy and they're super honest and they're really funny. And, and you know, I, I always know your poems when I see them. And like, I think you're a terrific poet. And like, so to, to the extent to which I could like, you know, pour fuel on that fire, I'm like, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a, as a win, you know. <laughs> like you know, I can't, can't take credit for it, but I can take credit yeah. for having excel or you know having yeah poured an accelerant on a flame that was probably going to burst out anyway. But like you know, well that's yeah. a that's an interesting part of I mean teaching. I always when I think of you, I think of how amazing you are as a poet, but how amazing you are as a teacher too. And the what the way that you think about poetry, you write a lot about poetry. You've been on fire writing about poetry. Tell me about mm. that. Yeah, well, you know, I got this 
idea to write this white poetry book and it was kind of this like you know um it, you know i i like i was i always like writing prose because it kind of like scratches this itch that i have of like can i like work my way through an idea in a certain kind of way that i you know that i don't really do in poems Mm-hmm. you know like it's just a different kind of space for me that I like to do with my brain but I just got this idea I was like oh you know you know I've been I've said so many times and I've heard other poets say so many times like you know oh, like like I can't explain my poems I, poetry you just have to read it and you know right. blah, blah. Yeah. and like and I there is like a lot of truth to that you know mm-hmm. but I was like what if you did try to explain it? Mm. Like, what would it be what would happen yeah. And that, and I just couldn't shake that idea. I was like, mm. I just couldn't, I couldn't get it out of my head. I was like, what would happen if I did that? What would happen if I did that? And, I, and so finally I just started. And mm. um, I originally did it actually um, as a lecture at the Tin House. Mm-hmm. Um, that was, and I wrote a lot about Ashbury actually. Yeah. And, um, and I gave this lecture one summer that I was at Tin House. And I was like, oh, there's something here like 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 there's something to write about here you know and 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 there's a lot more to say and a lot more to get into and I was just like okay I'll just let this impulse go and see what happens you know and so I ended up writing this book but it was very much like um a dare to myself almost yeah I was like can I talk about poetry and not and not be full of shit yeah basically that was like that was more or less like the dare right yeah and like you know I think that there are problems with the book for me there are things that I didn't explain or dig into as much as I would have liked you know I you know but I all knew when I was writing it that it was going to feel like it's impossible it's like you can't cover everything but like I do think that I didn't I don't think that there's any bullshit in that book like I don't think there's any like you know saying stuff about poetry that just like sounds good or like plays into some idea we have about it or something you know I think it's an honest attempt to engage with hard topics and like so for me I was like you know it was hell to write it it was hell to write it and I wrote a lot of it like when my when my kid was born um so I like literally wrote a lot of drop by the pin like on sleeping on my lap you know or like right there like I was typing over him or whatever because that was Mm -hmm. and so that was weird and kind of cool and and felt felt somehow like so I don't know what the right word is it felt so extreme yeah <laughs> and and so and so I liked just sort of pushing myself in that way too you know my mind pushing my brain as far as I could in that way and I learned a lot about writing and but then I was like oh god I'm never gonna do that again like that's horrible like I like you know, I just all I do is write poems like I did not want to ever be talking yeah. like that again and then but I got sucked back in and now I'm fucking doing it again <laughs> and it's like I so I don't know now I'm not writing another prose book and it's like ugh, why do I do this to myself you know it's 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 tough yeah. do you worry that that's gonna like take away from your poetry or anything like I always feel like a little because I've suddenly got the prose bug too. And I'm like, I should be writing poems. I should be writing poems. I'm like, I just want to write about poetry right now. Like it doesn't take away. I mean, I'm not saying it couldn't for other people. It might, but it doesn't because honestly, like I um well, for one thing, I mean with why poetry, I just ended up thinking so much harder about about some poems mm-hmm. and how they work. You know, even poems that I thought I knew pretty well you know, just digging in. I mean, just like going almost like practically like syllable, but phoneme by phoneme practically, yeah, you know, yeah. these poems. It's like, what's going on here? What's going on here? What's going on here? It's like, yeah. taking, I was like, a, I was like, a, my dad, when, when, you know, when I was, I think it was either before, right before I was born or when I was really little, he had an Alfa Romeo, you know, one of those little sports yeah, cars. my mom had one too. <laughs> right. And he, t- he and my uncle Joe um, took it apart because they were going to put it back together oh, again and then they couldn't put it back together of course they couldn't oh. yeah <laughs> of course so, they. so but 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 it was that impulse to like to like dismantle yeah. something like you know i'm thinking about you know certain poems that i've lived with my you know entire like life as a writer and just dismantle them and be like what is actually happening here yeah. you know and like and and you know so that was i think great for my own sense of like what's possible in poems 
Um, and also just, you know, I, for me, I don't know if it's true for other people, but for me, the more I'm writing, the better I write. So that yeah. goes for prose, that goes for, I mean, even sometimes for emails, you know, if I'm like, if I'm like, not, not just boring emails, but like, you know, if I'm like writing you an email or something, I spend 20 minutes doing it. It's like yeah. still writing, you know? Totally. So, so, so I don't really like, um, you know, I don't really like, for me, it doesn't take anything away. It just, no. I, 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 it's, I'm keeping up my chops. You know, but I'm always keeping up my chops because like, I mean, I, you know, I, and I'm not always good about this, but, you know, Matt Rohr and I have been collaborating on poems for, for, we've been doing it for, I kind of want to say like over a year and we write, we write back and forth every day. And I probably shouldn't even be talking about it because it's like just completely private work. But I was just thinking about, you know, he and I are like emailing each other 20 times a day. Yeah. Collaborating. And so we're just, we're just, it's not for publication. It's not, we're just, we're just keeping up our... Our, That's, our our technique basically yeah you know? and i think having having like one person that you do that with on email is like a game changer for like a poet to keep you know it's like yeah it doesn't have to be this precious thing where every poem's like a winner like you can just like no. but you're doing it on the line yeah. level you almost do it on the word level I and mean, that's why collaborating is so great because and matt is a fucking genius and he and he's he i mean he does shit he regularly does shit that's just like mind blowing and so yeah. you know so he'll do it and i'm like i gotta step up and i gotta do i right. have to turn this line back around you know and it has to be as good or it has to be better and i have to be like i have to you know or i have to mess with him i have to make it harder for him this next line so how am i going to do that like and so so i'm always you know between that and with my email i mean i hate email obviously like any sane human being i hate email i'm like but I also think of my emails, I always try to make them interesting to myself yeah. to write. Right, right. Um, so, you know, so I'm like, uh, to me, I'm like, if I can make this practice or I can make this, you know, some, there's something in there, some little phrase or some little moment that I kind of like fuck around or just like, or just try to turn around, you know, that's, I'm, I'm just like trying to always be working because like you, you know, you have a kid, I have a kid. It's like, you know, it's, you know, it's ridiculous, the, the amount of demands and, and so you just, you have to try to find your work where you can, right? Yeah, and it's really dangerous to to think that you can't have both. You know that that to, that you have to choose like some sort of domestic like servitude over <laughs> over creativity. No. You know, and so no, I, I mean, also kids. Yeah, whatever. We don't even talk about kids, but like you know, but it's sure they bring a lot of that creativity and a lot of that like life that you would otherwise have. But they also drain you like and destroy every every ounce of your like self yeah <laughs> so so yeah. you know you got to fight back against that too yeah. you know while also loving them right, right. so it's, it's you know but but i think poets that's a nice thing about poetry is like it, it's it's a place where you can like come circling back around this thing i was saying before it, i think it is a place where you can push back in a way that isn't violent or it isn't it isn't it isn't reactive or it doesn't it doesn't take away from somebody else or it doesn't hurt somebody else it's like you're pushing back it's like that great quote from Wall Stevens, um, noble writer in The Sound of Words, you know, the, the violence, the, uh, the imagination is a violence from within that pushes back against mm. the violence from without, mm. you know, and it's like, it's like, it's like he, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're pushing back, you're creating a space that you're physically like pushing. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, no, you know, you, this is not going to get any closer than here. You know, I'm going to push, you know, that way the ball. And then I have this space here, you know, to be whatever fucked up person I am. You know? <laughs> but um, I hundred yeah. percent agree. Well, uh, yeah, of course you do, because you that's that's what your poems do for. Yeah. Well, I would love it if you read us a poem to oh, sing us out. Sure. Um, of your own choosing. Well, oh, of my own choosing. Wow. Oh my God. The responsibility. Um, well, in in light of that. Oh wait, um, wait. The new poem. The new poem. Oh, I can read that if you want. Yeah. Um, or maybe should I read? I can also read. read. What are you thinking? Well, I can read. Um, well, would you be embarrassed if I read astrology? Because it has your name in it. I was going to ask. It? Yeah. <laughs> um, Even though yeah, you're sort I don't of remember. <laughs> no, I'm not dissing. I, I'm not dissing you at all. Actually, it's the opposite. I'm like feeling feeling. Yeah, you're you're dissing yourself. But I, but yeah, I think this was after I saw you. Was it at June, Juniper it was at, where I saw you? Yep, was at Juniper. You came for a reading. 
when I came for a reading, I was feeling very strange because, you know, that place is, you know, I was an undergrad at Amherst College, and then I went to grad school at UMass, and I taught at the Juniper Summer Institute for years and years and years, and then, and that's where I met my wife, Sarah, at the, at right. there, she was, she was in a fiction workshop, and I was teaching poetry, and, you know, so, and then I came back, and I was just like, oh my god like no one even knows who i am here like this i don't even belong here anymore it was so oh, wild shit. it was like kind of it's awful so funny you were thinking that because i was like oh it's a Prue's here it's so well, excited you and me we know each other okay yeah. but like so me there were there were five people there who knew that i like like who, who i had a connection with but like that scene had moved yeah. on as scenes do right 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 and i was like and that, but it was like i think i was just feeling kind of like oh you know? yeah i but know I, when, when when one is in a mood there's really nothing you i was in a it. mood so so anyway so i wrote um i wrote this poem and, and bianca you appear in it and also dotty lasky um my beloved dotty who's so two great poets are in here um all right so i'll read it it's called astrology astrology Dottie, I hate astrology and the way you sit there, you and Bianca, looking down on my poems. I can almost hear you thinking, how did he get so old? Why did we ever pretend we liked to listen to his various hues of darkness and occasional pale glows? This is projection, I know. I know you are full of true love for poetry made not just by yourself. And for that, I really do love you. Also, I adore your earrings, the little toy fruits and plates, and your brilliant, terrifying mind. But the way you look down, even though you do not, with the mystics on me, destroys me. Dottie, you are a green jewel, a scary green jewel that can tell the future so much better than astrology, which is really stupid. Though no birds get killed, so I guess it's harmless, unless you let it direct you. But then again, Dottie, your last book made me afraid to be a mother. I add it to all the others, the real fears about my son. I will tell you sometime how different he is. It causes me to marvel, even when I feel the fears. I imagine them in some part of my mind. Let us not call it the library. Let us call it the door. Dottie, your poems make me want to open it. For a long time now, truth has been a ridiculous word for what power guides my mind, half asleep, pushing me further where I am so afraid to go. Dottie, you've seen my chart, so you know I was born on the terrible cusp of reason and dream. And there I will always remain waving at you as you pass in your green craft, knowing you will return. <sighs> Matthew, thank you so much. There's so much I wanted to ask you on top of this, but we'll just have to talk again too. We'll do it again. We'll do it again. It's, it's great to talk to you, just, Bianca. Yeah. I just, yeah. I, God, what you, what you do for poetry, I am, I'm deeply grateful. Well, I feel the same about you, and I can't wait to see your spot in Goshen. Oh, um, yeah. Land yeah, of Goshen. Yeah. yeah, if we can get you back on the right side of the country. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get there. I'll get there. All right, yeah, well, I'm sending love to you and Ben, and, yeah. uh, you know, it's it's great. Thanks for thanks for talking to me, and, you know, we'll let, yeah, let's do it again.